So welcome everyone to um, this session on fiscal and monetary policy at the CSE conference 2022. Um, it's a, a shame we're not meeting in person, but it's a great pleasure for me to um, welcome four fantastic presenters from, from all corners of the world. So it's, uh, um, there are costs and benefits to being online. Uh, we have um, four papers to be presented in this session. And uh, as the slide shows, the way we're going to run this is um, the four presentations back to back. Each will last about 15 minutes, no more. Um, and then we'll have, that'll give us about half an hour for, for Q&A. Um, can I encourage you to submit questions using the Q&A function at the, um, at the bottom of your screen? Um, all you need to do is make it clear which paper you're talking about, and you can either use the title of the paper or um, probably easier if you use the uh, presenter's first name, which you can see um, on the, uh, the sidebar of the presenters. Um, when questions come in, I will um, invite you to, uh, to speak to your question and you'll be unmuted. If you'd rather I just present the question, I can, um, I can try and do so hopefully in a spirit that uh, uh, is consistent with what you wanted to ask. Um, the panelists are also uh, able to and strongly encouraged to uh, make presentation, uh, ask questions and make comments as well. With that, however, we'll move straight to our second uh, presentation, which is, is Natalie. Um, and uh, Natalie, you have uh, 15 minutes as well. Um, and we can see your slides. And as long as you unmute yourself, we can hear you as well. Yes. Okay, so thanks, you, thanks a lot for attending this session and for, thanks for organizing. So this paper is titled Filling the Defensive Gap, the North's Reaction to the US Policy on International Family Planning Aid. So today, nearly half of all pregnancy worldwide are still considered unwanted or unmistimed. One of the reasons is a lack of access to family planning, so all means uh, to uh, have controls on uh, pregnancy. And uh, one reason of this lack of family planning is uh, a lack of sufficient funds. We have mostly three main uh, channels to fund uh, family planning. So out-of-pocket uh, expenditure from women, uh, domestic expenditure from the government and for developing countries, uh, international development aid. For uh, low-income countries, uh, international development aid is still uh, crucial to fund family planning. So uh, in the last year, it represented about half of total funding devoted to family projects. And within uh, international donors, we have a specific uh, donor, which is uh, the US. Why first? Because the US is by far the largest donor. So since 1990, uh, they devoted 55% of total aid disbursed to family planning project is uh, funded by the US. And so it means that the US is a dominant uh, donor in uh, these specific sectors. And as uh, you can may know, uh, a dominant donor may affect or not uh, the allocation of other donors because of uh, their behavior. So in this paper, I really uh, try to analyze how the donors adjust their allocation of family planning aid in reaction uh, to this dominant donor, uh, the US. Why is it critical? First, because the US foreign policy on family planning has undergone several important changes, inducing large high vo uh, volatility for recipient countries. These changes are uh, related to domestic uh, debate on abortion. So when a Republican is, uh, at the, is a president of the US, we do observe a large decrease in uh, family planning funding from the US. On the contrary, when uh, the US president is a Democrat, we do observe a large increase. So it means also that 
the way other donors interact with the US can affect the possibility to limit family planning aid volatility for recipient countries. If other donors substitute to the US, we should offer low level of volatility and low uh, crisis for a woman to have access to family planning projects. On the contrary, if other donors complement the US uh, allocation, it will reinforce uh, this uh, volatility. And here we have uh, two mechanisms at stake. So the traditional, what I call the traditional mechanism is the fact that if you look at previous literature on donor interaction, not only for family planning, but for all development aid, for food aid, for humanitarian aid, you, we find positive reactions, the complementarity between our donors because of different uh, mechanisms such as a competition or information sharing. But in the case of family planning aid, at the same time, we do observe uh, some uh, criticism from other donors. For example, 18, the EU uh, criticized the decision from trying to uh, cut family planning aid and call to fill uh, the citizenship gap in uh, family planning aid. So it means that empirically, we don't know uh, which uh, effect matters most and whether we should observe higher volatility or on the contrary, uh, some um, smoothing effects. And so in this paper, I will try uh, to uh, understand what is uh, the most important mechanism whether it's um, this shaming effect or this traditional positive reaction. To do so, I will present my empirical strategy, the next, uh, the main result, and some robustness, and uh, I guess some conclusion, uh, concluding on that. So just uh, to give you an idea of the data I use, I use IHME database on development assistance for us that covers uh, the period 1990 to 2020. It records bilateral flows of family planning aid from one donor country to a recipient country. So it's national uh, flows, but we have an additional information, which is the channel to which aid is, um, is allocated. So it could be bilateral, it could be multilateral, or it could be uh, for NGOs. And for NGOs, we know whether the NGOs come from uh, the donor country or whether it's um, a foreign NGOs. In this paper, I uh, restrict the analysis to traditional uh, donors. So I exclude some private donors such as Bill and Melinda uh, Bill Gates uh, funds, and there is no data on China. So, what I want uh, to uh, estimate is this classical equation of aid allocation. The allocation from donor D to recipient R at time T in family planning aid depends on some recipient characteristics, but proxy needs and uh, governance and, and something like this, bilateral uh, characteristics, a bunch of fixed effects, and the allocation of the US to the same recipient one year before. Obviously, uh, we have a problem of endogeneity. And so I uh, construct an instrumental strategy based on uh, US domestic political changes that affect uh, the US food, uh, family planning aid. So let me uh, explain you uh, this, um, this IV strategy. So this IV strategy will I mostly on a policy implemented by the US called the Global Gag Rule or the Mexico City Policy. So uh, let me just give you the most important uh, information to understand uh, this policy. So first, whatever, uh, if, even before 1984, the first year of implementation of the Global Gag Rule, organizations who receive US funds cannot uh, perform abortion using US funds, but can perform abortion using other funds. So for instance, French NGOs can obtain US funds to uh, provide a contraception and can uh, use French funds uh, to perform uh, abortion. 
starting 1984, there is a change uh, induced by an executive order from Reagan. Starting this uh, year, when the policy, the global gag rule is active, you cannot perform abortion whatever your funds. So the French NGO can obtain uh, French funds and US uh, funds, but whatever the funds, they cannot uh, provide abortion related activities. And so it means that for uh, non US NGOs, you have two uh, possibilities. First one, you decide to decline US funds in order to uh, still promote the NGO and perform NGOs. The second possibility is to agree for uh, US grants, but in that case, you can't perform NGOs. And in practice, a lot of non-US NGOs decide to stop obtaining uh, US aid rather than uh, stopping abortion-related activities. And this uh, leads to a large decrease in uh, family planning aid from uh, the US. And this policy is active once the president is a Republican as non-active when uh, the president is a Democrat. So let me show you how it affects family planning aid from uh, the US. So here in gray, you have the period where when the policy is active, and in white when the policy is non-active. And you see the decrease uh, during uh, the, the time the policy is active and the large increase during the time the policy is non-active. However, this uh, policy uh, rescinding and reinstatement just provide me temporal variation. I also need a cross-sectional variation. So following the literature on aid, I construct an indicator of recipient vulnerability uh, to this policy. And this indicator will depend on how frequent the recipient receive US family planning aid when the policy is not active. And it will also depend on how much US family planning aid is channeled to non-US NGOs, the ones who are affected uh, by uh, the policy. And just graphically uh, to show you that indeed, uh, depending on how frequent you receive aid, uh, US family planning aid or not, you are not affected uh, in the same way. And uh, similarly, uh, depending on the channel, clearly a only uh, country, recipient country uh, for which aid is mostly uh, channeled by uh, non-US NGOs are affected by the Mexico City police. So at the end, my instrument, it's just the interaction between the timing of and the family planning, um, the Mexico City policy and uh, this um, indicator of uh, vulnerability. So let me uh, show you that now. So here, each colon it depends on the controls and we will focus on the last uh, colon. So as expected, as the, the coefficient related to uh, the, uh, the instrument is negative. The more vulnerable you are to the family, to the Mexico City policy, uh, the higher the, the decrease in aid is. And if you look at uh, the 2SLS 2LS, 2LS, uh, estimate, we do observe a positive uh, coefficient, but non significant. It, it means that both mechanisms compensate. So the first mechanism, I, I remind you, is the classical uh, erding behavior, so positive reaction uh, from donors. We do observe in all other uh, kind of aid. But the second one, the thinning, this, uh, thinning the this gap, uh, compensates this positive behavior. So at the end, it means that for the specific sector of aid, other donors do not react significantly uh, to the allocation of the most important donor, the US. I also look at bilateral reaction uh, for each donor. So not a significant result, except maybe uh, for uh, New Zealand, but it's one above uh, 23, so, far. so I can't uh, rule out uh, the, the hypothesis of a, of a statistical effect. 
I also, I know differences between a rescinding and a restatement. So no uh, reaction either when the policy uh, become active when she was, the policy was also active and the reverse. If anything, I find a slight change in behavior after 2000, in the sense that after 2000, uh, if I exclude the 90s, the, um, the estimate is negative, but still not significant. And the only uh, situation where I find a positive and significant effect is when I use other data uh, from OECD, where uh, the definition of family planning is uh, more blurred. Uh, however, here uh, the, the order of magnitude of the is similar. So it goes in uh, the same way in the sense. I run different uh, placebo tests. So I look at the same thing, but uh, using allocation of other donors to non-communicable disease, to malaria, to agriculture, to education, uh, no effect at all. I also uh, look at false rescinding and restatement and the, at the re-election of Bush and Obama, nothing at all. And I also uh, look at a reaction to future uh, US allocation, again, uh, nothing. I uh, look at different robustness checks and uh, always a positive but non-significant uh, estimate. Uh, Effect. So, despite international calls, other uh, donors do not feel uh, this decency gap. However, it could be the case that Swiss calls can sell the traditional herding behavior we do observe in uh, foreign aid. It means that for recipient country, uh, we, uh, it induces a large volatility and decrease in uh, family planning pro um, projects. And so it may increase uh, women vulnerability uh, to, un, um, to unwanted or mistiming pregnancy with large uh, consequences in terms of well-being. Thanks a lot for uh, your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Stephanie. That was excellent. Um, again, great presentation, nicely on time. We'll have a chance to come back and, and uh, discuss this later. May, may I remind you, please feel free to add your questions and comments in the Q&A. And in the meantime, we will move to our uh, third paper. Tumisa Angolate is going to present it, The Macroeconomic Effects of Fiscal Policy in South Africa. Uh, you've got your 15 minutes, Tumisa. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for attending this session. So the paper that I'll be presenting today, it's co-authored by Romain and Nicola, and it's titled The Macroeconomic Effects of Fiscal Policy in South Africa from more of a narrative analysis. And though we say fiscal policy, we mainly focus on changes in personal income taxes. Now, why the changes in personal income taxes? Well, that's because personal income Texas contributes their largest share in terms of total revenue in South Africa, as you can see from the graph. And even when you compare South Africa to other countries, you find that South Africa has this high reliance on personal income taxes as a source of revenue, even higher than the OECD countries, Latin American countries, and other country groups. So this is why we then ask this question, what are the macroeconomic effects of personal income tax changes in South Africa? And in answering this research question, we aim to contribute to the literature, especially the South African literature in three ways. The first contribution is by constructing a new narrative measure for personal income tax shocks for South Africa. The second contribution is to the empirical literature of fiscal multipliers using this new data set or measure and an identification strategy that hasn't yet been used in South Africa, at least to the best of our knowledge. And then lastly, to then zoom in on the macroeconomic effects of personal income taxes, as opposed to other papers that look at more of the overall effect of tax changes. Now, in terms of the literature, so in South Africa, the literature has mainly focused on exploring 
or comparing different empirical uh, methodologies. And not much work has actually been done in terms of exploring this narrative approach to identify fiscal shocks or tax shocks. And that's what we want to do. We want to follow this international literature in terms of identifying um, tax shocks, which has been pioneered by Roma and Roma, both for fiscal um, monetary policy shocks and fiscal policy shocks. Other work that have been done in the international literature includes Remy and some IMF uh, papers. Now, the narrative analysis mainly look at the historical records of legislated tax changes. And within those historical records, they would then look at the motivation for the tax changes. And when I say they, I'm referring to Roma and Roma. Now, when they look at the motivations for the legislated tax changes, the aim is to then classify these tax changes into two main categories. So, so the first category, which falls under the epsilon T, these are tax changes that are taken by the government, tax changes, in response to any other factor having a negative impact on output. Therefore, then the government would then correct that by trying to return growth to its potential. So those are classified as endogenous tax changes. Also, for example, during recession, government might cut taxes in order to stimulate growth. The second category, which is the one that we are more interested in and that form the basis of our analysis is these exogenous tax changes. And these are tax changes that are taken more for long-term reasons and not really trying to return growth or output to its potential, but in some cases you want the economy to grow at a higher rate or they're more motivated for uh, by philosophical reasons, such as trying to make the tax system more equitable. So following Roma and Roma, what we you then do is we look at different information sources. These include the main budget speeches and reviews, the medium term budget policy statement, which is also called the mini budget. Then we then look at the legislated acts or bills and the explanatory memorandums. And the explanatory memorandums are actually the ones that contain their motivation for the tax change. Some of the characteristics of the shocks includes the timing, which is usually the effective date when the tax change become uh, effective. Then you also look at the size of the shock. So the size of the shock is the expected revenue effect. So for example, if it's an expansionary uh, tax policy shock, then is the foregone revenue from that tax change. Whereas if it's a contractionary shock, then it would then be the expected increase in revenue from that tax policy. Then we also look at scaling the shocks. In this case, we use the tax base, which is the non-agricultural non sector um, wages. Now, our fiscal policy variable is the average personal income tax rate, which measures the change in personal income tax revenue as a percentage of the tax base, right? But the problem is the average personal income tax rate changes in the personal income tax revenue um, can be due to, to both policy and non-policy um, reasons. So that is why we then need an instrumental variable for this measure. And for that, we then use this personal income tax narrative uh, measure, which is the change in the personal income tax liability and also divided by the tax base. Now, after our narrative analysis, we end up with about 47 uh, personal income tax shocks, of which 25, we classify them as exogenous and these form the basis of our analysis. Furthermore, we then classify this, these shocks in terms of anticipated and unanticipated shocks following Mertens and Raven, and then also whether they are transitory or permanent. In the case for South Africa, we find that most um, personal income tax changes are actually legislated re uh, retroactively. So they classi are classified as unanticipated and most of them are transitory. Now, this table gives a summary of the main tax shocks 
and can, this can be divided into about three periods. Now, the first period, which is from the mid 1990s until the end of the 1990s. So this is after the installation of the new government after the end of the apartheid regime. So following this, um, or during this period rather, um, a government implemented a series of tax reforms. So they basically wanted to reform their tax system to make it more simpler and also more progressive and equitable. So tax changes during this period include reducing the tax brackets, the number of tax brackets from 10 to six and also changing some of the marginal tax rates. Now, in the second period, which follows from the successful implementation of the tax reforms. Now, this period can be classified as one of the best period in terms of the South African history. The economy was doing well. And you, know, you had uh, the tax revenue, um, higher tax revenue. And what government then decided to do was to actually cut taxes for households. And the main reason is because as I've indicated, personal income tax revenue is the highest source of tax revenue. So then the government felt that the households should be the main beneficiaries of these increases in the tax um, revenue. So then they implemented several uh, tax reductions. And also during this same period, they also increased government spending. So it was a really good period during this time. Then the last period is in contrast to the other two periods. And this is the period when we then started seeing a reduction in tax revenue, the economy not doing well. And you also had this increase in government spending. Now that put um, pressure on the deficit and you then start having this um, increase in debt. So then government started then implementing some contractionary tax policy where they increased taxes through bracket creep and increase in some of the marginal tax rates. So during this period, we then classify these tax changes as deficit-driven tax changes because the aim was to reduce the deficit. So this is just a graphical representation mm -hmm. of the table. slightly more than halfway through table. the time allocation. Okay. So you've got slightly so less than half to go. Okay, so this is the graphical representation. And as you can see, um, you know, the tax policy in South Africa tended to be more pro cyclical. So this is during the South African Reserve Bank expansion dates, and we see all these tax cuts, whereas during the recession, you know, you see all these um, tax increases. Now, the method that we followed in, or the methodology that we followed in this paper is the one by Metin and Ravens, and is the structural vector autoregression instrumental variable uh, model. So it's kind of similar to what Natalie has presented, but in a more of an SVAR uh, model. And it's also called the proxy SVAR model. The period that we look at is between 1996 Q1 until 2019 um, Q4. And we look at three model specifications. So we look at the benchmark, benchmark specification, which looks at the full sample with all the shocks. Then we then look at the permanent tax uh, shocks where we only focus on tax changes that involved changes in the marginal tax rates. And then lastly, we look at the much shorter uh, sample size where date was slow. And the variables that we include in the paper is our fiscal policy variable, which is the average personal income tax rate. We then control for government spending, real GDP, and other variables, which include private investment and government debt in one model, then the X is then replaced in by unemployment and non-durable consumption and tax revenue and durable consumption. Okay, now because the results are similar, I'm only going to show one uh, specification because the results are pretty much uh, mainly similar. And what I'm showing here is the response of the other variables to a one percentage point reduction in average personal income tax rates, right? So it's an expansionary uh, fiscal policy. And what we see here is that the reduction in personal income tax rate um, result in, you also have uh, increase in government uh, spending 
And you also have an increase in real GDP and its subcomponents. And as I will show, so in private in, uh, investment also increases, though the initial response is uh, negative. And you also have an increase in government spending, but this depends on the specification. In some model specification, it's significant. In others, it's not significant when you look at the period when debt was low, which is the shorter simple uh, period. Okay, so now this is the same model, just replace the last two variables with personal income tax revenue and household consumption. And as I've said, the subcomponents for real GDP um, increase. And But what we also note is that in the first year of its implementation, personal income tax revenue declines. Right? Now, remember, this is an expansionary um, uh, tax shock. So this then indicates that in the first year of its implementation, this tax policy is not tax neutral. So government does lose some tax revenue from it um, initially. And then lastly, um, household consumption non-durable um, also increases and unemployment uh, decreases. Then we then calculate the implied tax multipliers. I think the main takeaway point here is that we do find peak multipliers of over one. And interestingly, when we look at only the permanent tax shock, so the, the tax changes that only look at the changes in the marginal tax rate, um, you find that's where you find the highest multiplier, tax multiplier. And then the last two slides shows basically how well does our proxy measure captures movement in the average personal income tax rate. And what we see here is that the relationship is the strongest, actually, when you look at the shorter um, sample size. Um, as you can see, the uh, confidence bands are, are narrower. And similar, this is a simple OLS um, regression of the tax shock on the narrative. And what you find is, yes, there's a positive um, relationship, so which means that um, you know, the, our uh, instrument is a relevant uh, instrument, but we also find that this relationship, the R squared, increases when you also look at the shorter sample size, which is uh, pretty much similar to what we find here. And that is basically what we uh, do in this paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Sang. That was that was excellent. Um, let's move to our final. Uh, paper. And again, let me encourage people to, to ask questions of any of the presentations so far, and indeed the next one from Nicholas. Um, and we're moving to a paper that's looking at um, monetary policy and its well, weather shocks and monetary policy using a DSG model from Uganda. So, Nicholas, over to you. You've got uh, 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much for the for the invitation and for accepting my, my application to present at this at this workshop. And uh, I'm, it's, it's on a topic which I'm really very passionate about. It's actually about weather 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 shocks and whether they really have implications on uh, macroeconomic uh, fluctuations. Uh, we have uh, I've decided to apply the topic to to appear weather shocks and monetary policy and empirical GSTE for Uganda. And this is the content of the presentation. So let's go straight to the background of the of the of the of, of this presentation. And uh, first, uh, let's look at the global tension. In the recent past, there's been a, a strong global tension given towards global warming and its impact on climate change and the related implication on, on macroeconomic growth and, and development. This is possibly be because of the, the increased level of weather shocks that we are being experiencing around the world. And uh, of course, that's attributed to what we've done over the years in terms of emissions of greenhouse gases, in terms of uh, as others, uh, 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 waste that we have also been actually disposing onto the environment, and of course, put population pressure on uh, aspects like land. Ultimately, we have we have ended up de uh, deteriorating the ozone layer, and then we have raised the level of global temperature, and that has translated into the, the melting of the, the glaciers and then depletion of forests in the tropical zones, like in the area where I live. 
In, in terms of the Polyjet agenda, uh, the impact of uh, climate change or weather shocks have received a lot of Polyjet agenda. Uh, the UN Millennium Development Goal number seven on environmental sustainability have handled that issue at, in extensively and, uh, and tries to address it. And then the UN Development Goal number 13 takes urgent action to combat climate change was also an initiative that was intended to try to deal with climate change. And more recently, uh, we have had uh, climate conferences one of them is the Paris conference and, 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 and of course the conference in Glasgow just a few months ago, which also tries to actually put efforts to combat issues of climate change. In terms of, uh, of looking at it in, 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 in the context of how the countries are set up, we, I, I note that uh, climate change tends to uh, adversely affect developing countries much more than the, the advanced economies. Because the advanced economies are well diversified and therefore they have other options that they can actually use to actually uh, evade or actually adapt themselves to the climate uh, uh, climate shocks. The, the, uh, the developing countries are largely, largely actually have agriculture play a major, a major input in their economic activities. And this is mostly for the countries that are available uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in those countries, rain, rain fed agriculture actually uh, dominate economic activities. So you have most of the economic activities are either linked directly to rain fed agriculture or they already actually uh, uh, get input from the rain fed agriculture and therefore they have implication on supply side factors and which could actually affect the dynamics of both inflation and output. In terms of motivation, we look at three questions that we, we think are very important to actually to try to investigate for this purpose, for the purpose of this study. One is we want to try to quantify the contribution of weather shock to macroeconomic fluctuation or the business cycle dynamics of the country. Then, then the second one is to try to see how persistent are these shocks when, when they do happen. How persistent would the impact actually persist on the economy and the business cycle dynamic of the, the economy? Then, of course, we want to analyze one of the stabilization, the stabilization policy options available, monetary policy, and how it responds to, 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 the, to the economy's dynamic in, a, in an event of a shock of that nature. But you may want to ask yourself, why are we interested in all this? We are interested in all this, especially for our, for our case in Uganda, because first, agriculture plays a very important role in, in our economic activity. Most of our output comes from agriculture. It affects prices because if you look at our, our, our CPI basket, it's full of agriculture. A large share of the population is employed in agriculture. Hopefully, our major exports come from agriculture. And of course, this creates a very quite interesting uh, area that we could actually want to focus on and to see. And then, of course, rain-fed agriculture contributes almost 25 percent. A few, a few commercial farms that produce uh, sugar and, and so forth to use after irrigation, but much of them is actually rain-fed. But agriculture, despite the fact that it contributes only 25 percent of GDP, actually employs about 70 percent of the population. Like I mentioned earlier, on export commodities like coffee, tea, and, and tobacco comes from agriculture sector. And largely, most of them are rain-fed. And therefore, they, they provide intermediate inputs in our manufacturing sector within the country, but they also export items that we can actually export. Therefore, it's likely that our supply side shocks could actually have implication on, on domestic prices as well as on our export earning, and therefore, it can filter into the, our, our exchange rate uh, our dynamics as well. In terms of literature, uh, we note that there's been kind of some work already going on in this area. But the work has been split into, in, into about different dimensions. But we want to look at it from, 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 from the perspective of supply side shock first. And we know that in that area, there's been a more interest on the supply shocks coming from what was actually renewable, okay, non renewable source of energy like uh, petroleum. And this, uh, this has received a lot of attention, and there's lots of research on that. Of course, we quote one or two papers, but in, in the main document, you have all those papers that you can read. Then, of course, we look at the type of modeling approach that has been going on within the literature on this, on this climate change, on the supply side shocks and, and so forth. And we note that actually much of them actually relied on, on, on VARs, structural VARs, and, and all those econometric techniques that are available. Of course, they have their own limitations and their, and their advantages as well. And then in terms of the empirical evidence, uh, there's been a growing level of empirical evidence on climate change in developing countries. Uh, for instance, if you look at a paper on, by Manso in, 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 in Malaysia, and then Gilbert, of course, understanding high, high prices in, the, in, in, uh, in Australia. And then there has also been uh, a more recent development paper which actually looks at an item of this nature for the New Zealand as well. Then we try to move in and try to motivate the study by looking at whether the, our, our own argument or our interest really matches up with the data. For instance, we want to look at the business cycle fluctuation evidence. And then and the first aspect we want to try to look at is 
is how does it how does fluctuation in agriculture output relate to the fluctuation in output of GDP? And you note that uh, agriculture is is what we have we have underlined at green. So you note that agriculture actually fluctuates actually much larger than the fluctuation in GDP. And uh, when you compute it in terms of the standard deviation, the standard deviation for agriculture fluctuates is much larger for, the, for during our sample size. And then of course real GDP is here fluctuating, but also we, we also try to plot for you how weather has been fluctuating over the period of time using our, our index for weather shocks, which I will is, is, uh, explain a little later on. Then in terms of uh, price dynamics, we also look at it in terms of, uh, of, of food price inflation and then the core inflation. And then we note that you, you can note that the green line, which is okay, the, the uh, output inflation or, or, or food price inflation, of, of course, uh, uh, Fluctuate actually much larger, but from 2016, you can see that there is fluctuation actually it tends to actually match the, the rate of inflation. In this case, uh, we are looking at headline, which is blue, and then core, which is actually black, and they tend to move more or less actually in, in, in the same direction. Of course, with some element of a lag in, in response to the policy shock. So in terms of prelim preliminary, to motivate our DSGE and then to help us to actually structure the model, we, we decided that we actually first estimate a simple model. And then see how the uh, how how the economy res respond in, in in an event when we shock it in a in a simple model. So we employed a, an informational rich structure of our model that uh, examined the impact of a weather shock on on, 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 the, on, the, on the economy. And in that context, uh, you have a domestic variable or is, or is, uh, uh, available within here. Then you have a, a, the variables that are coming from the outside of the economy. The external variables are uh, put in at X, and then we try to shock it. When we do that, uh, we of course, we do the usual uh, 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 econometric techniques of transforming the variables and then and then and then working with them to check whether they're stationary or not, and then we try to Im impose a unit shock in weather and see what what comes out. Our findings show that okay from the structure of our model shows that uh, this is what actually turns out. So if we put a unit percentage negative shock on weather or an agriculture output, you can see agriculture is down here. The the last graph on on your left. And agriculture gets shocked much deeper, and then it actually tends to, to, to respond back at about 12 quarters, tends to actually respond back to actually its own steady state, and then moves back forward. Of course, this is a shock, but of overall GDP, because the economy, economy is getting well diversified, you see that the, the impact is there, but it's actually fairly a little muted, but it actually has an impact. So that addresses one of our other initial question, whether it really has an impact on the business cycle dynamic. Of course, on, on inflation, uh, because agriculture considered agriculture output or food considered a large basket of, of our consumption and CPI basket, therefore you can see the impact on, on actually both core inflation and food price inflation actually picking up. Definitely, because we are an, an, an agriculture export dependent economy, you can actually see the impact on exchange rate through the export channel. Now our model is the DSGE model that we use to actually investigate this. This is the basic uh, representative agent model. Where we have uh, agents as, as, as mostly known to you, we have households, we have farms, and then we have policy institutions. In this case, we are mostly large, largely focused on the central bank. And because Uganda is a small open economy, we will also incorporate the rest of the world so that we can we can filter in shops from the rest of the world and also have an element of export also go out as well. Uh, in terms of the, the, the shock, as in, in common with DSGE models, we, have, we are going to have multiple shocks, and then we'll, we'll also, those shocks will definitely help us to explain the, the, the complicated the uh, phenomena and then the dynamics of the model. The model is a small open... We've got uh, about four minutes left. The model is a small open economy. Uh, it's argumented for... with. Uh, of, of, okay, following the, the, the approach of uh, Gali to 2005, and we argument it into a two sector model such that one sector is, is involved in agriculture production and the other sector is involved in the other uh, production of non agriculture outputs. Of course, we solve the model, calibrate, and estimate it to fit the, 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 the dynamics of Ugandan data. I want to run through the model very fast, but you have it in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the paper in case you just want to actually have a look at it. So the main feature of the model is to have agriculture production, and agriculture is assumed to be produced by, by, by household, and the input that goes into production of agriculture are the weather shocks, which we, are, we, are, we actually use uh, uh, this uh, uh, variable to actually denote it. And then we have land. Land is assumed to be fixed, and it's a course of food bar here. And then we have labor, which is also available from the household and goes into the, into the agriculture sector as well. So then agriculture is affected by those variables, and this is the production function for the agricultural farms. 
And then, of course, the other sectors use the standard optical production function that's used in most of the, the, the DSTE model, and that where household provide capital and labor to the, to, to the production of goods, and therefore they also receive wages, rents from, from capital pro provision and any dividends or profit from the, from the farm. We aggregate the, the entire model and we have the goods aggregated from, from, from the two sectors into one sector such that relative prices within the two sectors will have an impact on the economy. Then of course, policy is, is, is likely from the central bank. The central bank has a reaction function and the central bank reaction function is, is that such that the central bank tend to react to, 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 to the inflation and also react to an output gap inside here. And then of course, there's, there's that element of the central bank actually calling back on itself, how it set its own policy by smoothing the policy setting, which is actually taken care of by this part of the model. So this is, and then you have the rest of the world, so that we can have imports and exports as well, because we do import some agricultural, uh, agricultural output as well, and, and also do export output. Uh, uh, the model is a flexible price model, and therefore we use the cultural approach to do that. Wages we assume to be fully flexible because we don't have lots of information on wages in Uganda, so we allow any prices to be rigid and adjust slowly. In the short term, then there's market clearing conditions with imports and exports, and then of course we we optimize, get the steady state, log linearize the model, and we provided after the log linear the, the log linear linear equation in the in the in the in the in in, in, in the main paper which you can actually take download from the website as well. In terms of the data, we use ten variables and cover that period. The most important thing that you need to take care of with the data is the weather index. The weather index is, is developed using a 12 month moving average of rainfall, which is based on a monthly basis, such that we can pick out the dynamic or the business cycle in the rainfall itself. Because if you try to use the rainfall on a monthly or on a quarterly basis, you tend to have numbers that are actually moving up and down like a, like a, a random walk. The foreign variables are, are, are based on, on the trade weighted share of, of our main uh, uh, import, uh, uh, import and export countries. The, the data is adjusted and unfiltered, such that it, is a, it, it takes out the, the business cycle dynamics. And then in terms of estimation, we use uh, the, the user structure uh, framework of estimation of DSTE model. And uh, we transform the data, we do the structural parameters. And then, of course, we use Bayesian estimation with full information approach provide, uh, um, by providing priors at some point. And then, of course, after the next edition as well, the model is estimated in dynamic running in a MATLAB environment. In terms of uh, our output from the DSTE model, that, and which we need to actually compare with output that we've got from the structure of our model, we know that the Bayesian impulse response function to a unit shock to actually to climate uh, to, to weather shock respond in this way. So GDP comes down as did before. This time, actually, because of some errors in the model, I think we still don't have it coming out from zero exactly because we want it to come from zero and then it gradually gets back to its own stable level. I don't know why it comes from a fairly bigger figure. Uh, output uh, food prices tend to get affected. Agriculture output is also affected. Core inflation is affected, of course. Then you have an impact on exchange rate as well. And then when we look at it in terms of uh, of, 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 okay. Okay. of the decomposition of the shop, how the shop actually tend to behave over the over, over the business. Because you're in your last minute, oh, last okay. minute so please move oh. towards conclusions. Okay, thank you so much. So we look at the influence in terms of the shocks, and then you can see that from uh, 2005, agriculture tends to now have a larger in shock. Uh, the shock one on agriculture is the one that shaded green, so that the green bars actually tend to be more prominent as we get forward. And when we look at it in terms of uh, 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 the forecast horizon, then in the forecast horizon, you can also see, you can also observe that uh, weather shocks actually tend to become, to actually become more prominent as to get outward into the economy as well. Then in terms of the implication of monetary policy, which we wanted to actually use to stabilize the economy, we know that in, when you can note that monetary policy will have a really minimal impact on the output and even minimal uh, output on a minimum output on minimum impact also on the output of agriculture output as well. And that's that that's one factor that we note. So in terms of moving very fast to the conclusion, we say that weather shocks drive macroeconomic fluctuation through its influence on agriculture production and relative prices. Uh, monetary policy at the moment has limited uh, impact on stabilization, given that the monetary policy looks at the short term and, uh, and the weather might need more adaptation and long term implication. Uh, we think fiscal policy could, could be employed to stabilize uh, for stabilization, given that, the, that its direct impact could actually have on, on, on the economy through tax measures, through public spending, through technology, and, and, and well designed community initiatives.
And then, of course, adaptation and international policy connection would be very vital for, for addressing issues to do with climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicholas. It's, uh, I'm sorry to have uh, hurried you along at the end because it's a very rich paper. There's a lot of, a lot of work in there. Um, okay, I'd like to open this up to, to questions. Um, I noticed our audience has remained a little bit hesitant. Um, so I'm going to uh, take advantage of being in the chair and, and start the, um, the comments. I've got a, a few comments on each paper, but let me um, start at the beginning with Khadija's uh, paper on debt default. Um, I had a couple of, a couple of observations and, and um, a question. Um, the observations are, uh, First, it's, it's the specificity of, of Mozambique as, a, as a, a case study to look at, because the default in Mozambique, the, the run-up of debt in Mozambique, um, from mainly from 2012, 2013, and the default in 2016, is very wrapped up in a particular, um, it's the tuna bond scandal uh, to some extent. So it's, it's to do with, with corruption, um, and the uh, way in which the government took, uh, took on risk onto its own balance sheet uh, when, when guarantees were called on these um, rather dodgy loans that were um, uh, put together by Credit Suisse uh, and others. And the default was also triggered by the reaction of the official creditors uh, when they discovered what had gone on. So the first comment is, um, concerns, is there a risk that you're calibrating a general model to, to an unusually um, particular circumstance? Um, but re related to that, my other observation, um, it's an observation in the second, and I'll finish with a, a question. The observation is in your motivating difference, and difference setup, it's almost as if you treat the the borrowing relaxation as an exogenous um, uh, decision by, by the IMF. To what extent though, is, is that actually an endogenous response to a kind of a, an emerging view about the, uh, the debt capacity, the borrowing capacity of, uh, uh, of low-income countries, where they've gone through a significant period of structural change, where Certainly at the time, around 2009, 10, et cetera, there was a perception that credit worthiness had increased and so access to market uh, was, was more feasible. So in a sense, they weren't, that the, some sense of the equilibrium uh, borrowing capacity had increased. And so that leads to my, my question about how would your framework handle changes in fundamentals rather than changes in, in um, discount factors or um, the kind of the sunspot effect. But again, going back to Mozambique, this is a time of the early discovery of significant natural resource wealth offshore um, and a view at the time that, that because of this, in a sense, the borrowing capacity, um, or the, the credit worthiness of the country had increased. And so, uh, in some sense, the, the long run equilibrium volume of borrowing, um, I say the volume of borrowing to bring the country to a longer run sustainable debt level um, was uh, justified not by changes in sentiment or, or discount factors, but uh, essentially changes in, in fundamentals. Yeah, I uh, think, thank you, Nicholas, for the presentation. I, I seem to miss uh, the point on. Uh, on the carbon tax proposal. I would like to know how feasible and applicable this proposal is for the case of Uganda. Thank you. Thank you, Enoch, and thank you, Chris. Uh, let me uh, begin by first saying, uh, uh, it's, that's, a, that's, that's an area where we want to, to move into, because as you note in the paper, we, we basically wanted to talk about monetary policy. Yeah, but I believe it's an area which is which is possible because there, there is a, an area where, where it is actually feasible to apply uh, carbon taxes in in the context of Uganda. First of all, let me uh, uh, qualify that actually Uganda uh, actually has has a, a large share of the informal sector, and uh, some of them could not be easily brought into the tax bracket, and have been taken the government quite a long period of time. 
But given that, we still have a number of industries that rely on, uh, on, on using fossil, um, fossil fuel, including actually generation of electricity in some part of the country. So those imposing tax on those elements could actually reduce their use and therefore make the agents switch to other options that we'll talk about on a later. Then the other aspect uh, where I think carbon tax could apply is on personal vehicles. While we may uh, exempt vehicles, commercial vehicles, that trucks that are transporting goods and services, but we could also okay, impose carbon tax on, uh, on, on, on fuel consumption by, by, by owners of personal vehicles, such that okay, we could also discourage use of vehicles which are fairly outdated so that agents can actually switch over to vehicles which are more, 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 en more energy efficient or the ones that actually work on with solar and, and those other aspects as well. Then the other aspects, which I think would be the best if it can be implemented, is actually to impose tax on, ch on uh, charcoal. Charcoal is a, is, is a form of carbon that is used here in Uganda. It has two impacts on the environment. First, it is uh, generated from, uh, from, uh, from wood lots, from the forest. So that means uh, agents have to cut forests before they can actually make those charcoal. But then burning charcoal also produces a lot of soot, which affects the environment. Now, imposing tax on, 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 on charcoal and charcoal and making it very difficult for household to buy charcoal would definitely make it very feasible and therefore I can discourage them from that. But I believe that should be coupled with a policy where actually government actually reduces on the price of, of hydroelectric power, which government is now generating in large quantity, and also, also make large investment in solar and other sources of, uh, sources of green energy that they can actually use to actually, to, to actually uh, uh, and that households can actually use to actually cook their foods and actually light up their houses as well. So those are the areas that I believe would actually work out nicely. So it can work out, but it should be a gradual tax that will take quite a bit of time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Um, can I follow up with a, uh, a couple of observations about your um, weather shocks and, and monetary policy? Um, two things that, that caught my eye. One. Uh, written down and one comment that you made. They, you've got a, a policy reaction function from the central bank, uh, which is essentially a, um, a kind of tailor rule. Um, but it's defined over headline inflation. And what your weather shocks are doing are basically hitting um, non-core uh, inflation. It's, it's, um, there is... There is uh, a lot of the agriculture that you're looking at is indeed tradable. Um, your weather shocks are kind of proxying for supply side shocks. Um, and normally if you were writing a model like this, Dan, you might define the policy rule in terms of core inflation rather than the non-core. And from what I understand about the way in which the Bank of Uganda operates, it's, it's very sensitive to the distinction between core and non-core inflation. Um, and so, my first point is by redefining your policy rule in terms of core inflation, and then looking at what that implies for the path of headline inflation, if, if the central bank is targeting core, um, do you get any uh, important differences in, in, um, uh, in the properties, in the kind of stabilizing properties of monetary policy in the face of weather shocks? And the second point I wanted to make about is about the weather shock that you, you mentioned. And you talked about the problem of just using monthly data and you, you elected for a kind of 12 month moving average. But in rain fed agriculture, what matters is not average or moving average um, rainfall, it's, it's, it's excess or deficiency at critical points in the year at harvest and at planting. Um, and they can be very different. I, I say this because I did some work with the Bank of Tanzania on in, uh, modeling uh, rainfall shocks and inflation uh, in Tanzania. And there it mattered enormously how you constructed that weather shock. And we find that we got really poor results with the um, uh, moving average measure, as opposed to constructing measures that actually tried to look at deviations from long run seasonal averages at critical points in the, in the harvest cycle. So that may be something you, you want to, uh, to come back to at a later stage. So 
don't feel obliged to respond on any of these points. They're just observations. Uh, but if you want to respond, please, please do. I think the, both of them are very good observation. First of all, I, I need to go back to the model and uh, re-estimate with, with, the, with the various sets of inflation uh, measures. So headline, core, and then also the, the measure of inflation based on agricultural output itself only, agricultural profit of inflation. And then of course, in the second part, uh, there's need for a lot of work to do on, on developing an index, because the index definitely guides how the dynamics of, 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 of the weather shock that affects the economy. So actually, I'll take up your proposal and then try to look at the paper on which you work in Tanzania, study it at depth so that I can actually work at my numbers and see whether it will affect the dynamics. Okay. Because the model runs very well until when you put data to the model. Then the model starts to, to tend to get a little bit of, of, of zigzag at the corners, yes. So that could actually improve the, the, the running of the estimation. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, that's the truth of... Uh, all, all models are fantastic until you have to confront them with data. Um, let me turn um, to Tumisang. I had a, one quick question on, on your paper. And again, I encourage others to, to pitch in here. I'm not seeing many people um, appearing. Um, you presented some very interesting results at the end um, where you reported tax multipliers. What I wasn't clear about from the presentation is whether these were linked to the long-term or structural um, changes in, in personal income tax and whether there's an important difference between your the multiplier effect of cyclical tax changes from the long run tax changes, whether you're able to, to compute comparative measures. Maybe, maybe I just missed the misread the slide and you were looking at both, but were those for the long run structural changes or were they for the, the cyclical endogenous changes? Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if I would say they for the long run. Um, uh, yeah, because um, basically the, okay, so the, the tax multipliers basically measures the um, implied um, or the, out, the output um, effect from the implied um, reduction in uh, Texas, yeah. right? So what I'm, um, I'm not um, sure of actually in terms of answering your question, maybe we could start with, what do you mean the long run structural changes and the cyclical one? I think maybe I'm not understanding the question. Uh, what I meant is that when you motivated your paper to start with, you talked about two different classes of tax change Yes. Those that are cyclical or endogenous, the yes, ones yeah. responding to the deviation from output gap. And then you were talking about those that were part of long run structural transformation, so to speak. Changing okay, structure. yeah. And I was wondering whether your measure was specific to one or other of those uh, measures of the tax change, or whether it was, and if it was, whether they differed. For example, do you get more of a multiplier effect from a tax change when it is occurring in a cyclical sense, as opposed to a measure of the multiplier effect when it's a change in a structural sense? Okay, so yeah, so okay, so basically, based on the the focus of um, the paper and the assumption that we are identifying these structural tax changes, then I would say it's more of the long long run. Okay. But because I haven't done the, I wouldn't, because we haven't really done the comparison, if, if I may okay. uh, say that. So I, I wouldn't know, um, the, you know. Yeah, okay. The, okay. the difference, yeah. But it would be an interesting comparison to, yes. to do because uh, um, we know that, that the, the multipliers are likely to change depending on, on how much slack there is in the economy. So it will depend on the. Um... Uh, yes, actually, um, it's actually the one of the things that we also want to look at. It's more of looking at the the time varying um, parameter one, um, the S var IV. Yes, um, that's uh, one of the things we want to actually look at. Yeah, because now we're making the assumption that um, uh, they kind of um, are the same, respective of where you are in yeah. 
in the cycle feed. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I think since, again, everybody's very shy, I had one final question for Natalie, uh, if I may. Um, I think this is a really nice, really interesting paper um, because it does uh, challenge a lot of um, assumptions and prejudices that may be in the out there in the discourse around um, aid and donor behavior. Um, is there any scope for generalizing this approach um, a little bit? Because it seems to me that one other area where um, dominant donor, well, it's not just one area, but there's, there's a number of areas where dominant donors um, really can change the landscape and, and this sort of, um, uh, this gap, whether you call it a decency gap or whatever gap it is, um, seem important. And they're, so for example, over the last, I don't know, is, is it a decade now that um, the US aid program to Africa really emphasized one or two key areas like power Africa, the sort of focus on infrastructure and power generation at the expense of other areas that they may previously have been supporting. And not just family planning related stuff, but other, other forms of say social support to social sectors or education or whatever. Or I suppose going forward, one of the interesting areas might be around um, um, green transition and environmental policy. Um, and I suppose I'm just interested in your thoughts about that, whether you see there are opportunities for extending this neat uh, approach that you've got to to other areas of um, uh, of donor behaviour and the um, uh, the offset that that dominant donors generate. So clearly, it could be really interesting. But the problem here is that you need some uh, exogenous variation that only occurs from the donors. And this is uh, the key point and the difficult point to find a case where you have a such uh, domestic driver uh, change mm -hmm. uh, in the allocation of the, uh, of the dominant uh, donors. Mm -hmm. So in the previous work, uh, I did it a relatively uh, similar thing for food aid and the EU. And here, clearly, I again I find a positive uh, effect as uh, usual. But uh, yes, uh, this um, change uh, from infrastructure uh, to social uh, sectors, mostly uh, driven not only by the US, by the World Bank, should be interesting to, uh, to look at and whether there is this dominant donor effect. Yeah, I, I agree that one is, is harder. I was thinking more about. For example, the U.S. declaration under the Trump administration about uh, disengaging from um, uh, the Paris Accords or um, views around uh, funding of WHO, um, it, again, in the health area. But uh, I completely agree that it's, it's a much less crisp way of, um, of doing this. Folks, we're getting very close to time, but I noticed that Nicholas has his hand up, so I would like to... Uh, invites Nicholas to have the final word. Oh no, it's not the final word. I wanted to have to have a small question for Katija. Well, yeah, it's very, yeah, it's very interesting. Is is an, in an area which is going to be of, of interest to many people because in the recent past people have accumulated lots of dates. But uh, my question is purely on the domestic component of the date. First, the first part of the question is: um, uh, Does the does the, the model have both domestic and foreign dates? In its no. estimation, of course, we have both <laughs> domestic and foreign. And if it does have, then how, how does the, the impact of the, the default on domestic debt actually transition inside the model itself? Well, folks, we're just past four o'clock. Um, first of all, let me thank all the four presenters for just great papers, really enjoyable, um, really good presentations, clear, focused presentations of really nice papers. And I um, uh, I hope you enjoyed the opportunity of presenting. Um, secondly, thank you for um, uh, the comments. Um, uh, all of a sudden, uh, we're out of time, but I've got some uh, 
two more uh, comments that have come through, but what I'm going to propose, um, they're, they're again from, from Enoch. Um, can you take these up bilaterally? You can find, you can chat with participants through the program, the CSAE program. You can find names and chat with people through the, um, the CSAE. You just log on to the program, the conference website, you'll be able to find participants because I think we've got to close now. But let me just thank all the participants again. Um, and hopefully we'll see many of you at the CSAE face-to-face -face, uh, in 12 months time.